Amen. Appreciate that, Miss Brenda. I appreciate everything this morning. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to serve here at Victory Baptist Church as your pastor. And I uh, appreciate and love every one of you and, and uh, my family. We love you all and appreciate you all very much. We count it an honor and a privilege to serve the Lord. And, uh, and we appreciate the opportunity again to be here. And when these young people are up here, I just got a couple things to say. And you could be flipping your Bibles to Psalm 24 or 20. Yeah, Psalm 24. But in a moment, you can stand, but not this second. You don't have to write this second. But I was watching these young people up here on the stage, and a few things stuck out at me. Number one, what stuck out at me was Walker. And where you at, Walker? Did he already go out the door? He was singing. And every single Wednesday, he says, I ain't singing today either. But he got up on the stage. So I appreciate Walker. And then... And then I like little sis over here. She always wants a microphone. And, uh, and I, I love that. And then I seen Elijah with his hand raised up. And let me tell you something, what I've seen over the years. Okay. I've seen a lot of young people, kids that genuinely and innocently, innocently worship the Lord and express that even with the raising of their hands. But you know what I've also seen over the years is those hands go down as they get older. And let me tell you something, folks. Um, the Bible talks about lifting up holy hands, specifically to men to lift up holy hands as you pray. And, and so um, the amens, the lifting up our holy hands, um, being active in our worship, um, this is something that the Lord inhabits as he inhabits the praise of his people. And there's my friend Walker, who I'm going to put him, I'm going to put him on the special singing list for now on. But uh, <laughs> I told you. So, and also, I appreciate the skit that y'all found and played, but I'll be honest with you. Them two guys is pretty funny. But that guy on the left-hand side who kept saying he appreciates for nothing, the only face that I could picture up there was Walker <laughs> saying that too. So anyway, let's stand together in honor of God's word this morning concerning the Psalm 24. Um, for those, I guess, who are going to Children's Church, if they're not already gone, they can be dismissed to go there. And in Psalm 24, beginning in verse 1, as we've been focusing on getting refocused upon the Lord Jesus. We seen him in Psalm 23 a couple weeks ago as the shepherd. And then on last week, we seen him in Psalm 22 as the savior. Uh, today, we want to see him as the sovereign. Um, uh, folks, in Psalm 22, we see a picture of the cross. And as J. Vernon McGee says in Psalm 23, we see the crook, the shepherd's crook, the shepherd's staff. And then, of course, in Psalm 24, we see the crown as Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so wherever you're at today in your life, it's time for every one of us to refocus upon the Lord Jesus. If we've had our eyes set upon him in the first place, if you've never put your eyes upon the Savior, then today be the day for you to look upon him and to trust in him. But let's read Psalm 24 together. It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul in vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. For this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O God of Jacob, is a better understanding. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. 
For who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you again today. We thank you so much for this time of worship. I thank you for each person and each family that's present here today. I thank you for those that are tuned in by some other way, whether it's Facebook Live, maybe it's somebody tuned in through a podcast or a radio program. Maybe they're close by. Maybe there's somebody on the other parts of the world. Um, Lord, I just pray that uh, as you are high and lifted up in this place today, as you're uh, word has went forth through song and through the preaching of your word in just a moment. I pray that it would uh, find those that are in need of hearing your word today. And as we believe and trust that your word will accomplish its purpose that you sent it out to accomplish, I pray that for those that are lost, they will come to you today. For us who are saved, I pray that we would be hearers of your word and receivers of your word and doers of your word that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And may we respond to you today in obedience and in faith. I ask for your help to preach today. I ask for your anointing. I ask, Lord, for the unction from on high to preach with boldness and with clarity of tongue, clarity of mind, the message you have for this time, for this, for this moment, for the folks within the sound of my voice as we give you the honor and the glory and the praise today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, in this old world in which we live in, many things happen that can cause us to become distracted. Sometimes it's just things that we just live in this world. You know, as a pastor over many years, I've run into folks and they, they struggle with what's going on in their life or they struggle the way that this world is or the way that things just are. And they want to have all the answers to all their questions and all their troubles and all their concerns. And, and sometimes, sometimes I have words that may be easy for some folks to receive and other times not so much. And sometimes the answers to why we go through what we go through is just life. It's just life. Uh, you got to understand, this world we live in, folks, there's some good times. There's some highlights. There's some mountaintops. But as I quote many times from Job, he says, man's born of a woman's a few days and full of trouble. We know that the, the fall of humanity and the welcoming in of sin and the results of sin and that of death and everything between sin and death, all that byproduct of everything that sin does, this life is, is not easy. It's difficult. It's troublesome. It's tiresome. It, it, it's, it causes you to become weary. And I'm not trying to be someone who's pessimistic, but at the same time as that, I want us to understand that this life is not not easy. But as this life is not easy, God himself has come down to this old world. You ought to understand that Jesus, when he initially made everything at the very beginning, he made everything very good. There was no sin and there was no results of sin. But after man sinned in the garden and death and sin came upon all of humanity and affected all of creation and Satan, as he rebelled in heaven and he was cast there out and the angels that rebelled with him, you have now, as we understand him as Satan and the demons that are just roaming this old world, uh, we got a lot of stuff that we deal with. But the Lord himself did not leave us just by ourselves. He came down to where we are. First of all, he's everywhere at one time. But God, the second person, the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, took on human form through a miraculous conception in a virgin birth and walked amongst sinful humanity. Not only was he tempted in all ways, likened unto man and never sinned, but he also has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So as he takes on the role of a high priest, he is one who is compassionate 
and empathetic because he understands all in which we go through, folks. God himself doesn't just know what you're going through because he is an all-knowing God. He understands perfectly because he came down and experienced the things of this world. And so when we think about all this life, whether it's just life in general, that's, that's the struggles. And if you have to get more specific in your own personal life, you know, the things that we go through sometimes just get us off track. And it's not always negative things. You know, sometimes we go through hard times. They bring us to question. We, we get our eyes off the Lord. Other times we, we things that are going on in our life that distract us. Maybe things that we consider blessings from God. I've watched folks get new jobs. They say this is of the Lord and it takes them away from God because they're more concerned about their work than they are their Lord. There's folks that receive certain other types of blessings. Maybe it's material things or whatever it may be. And they're, oh man, God's really blessed me and he blessed me with this and he's blessed me with that. And it's taken away from the Lord. Many times you follow throughout the scriptures, we find that folks get distracted by the things that God's blessed them with, or at least we attribute it to God. Sometimes I'm not sure if it's from God because he definitely is not trying to get you off track. But we can be off track. We can be, um, you know, become, uh, you know, a person our eyes are not on the Lord. And so as we think about getting back to, to seeing the Lord as we're supposed to, David penned Psalm 23, a psalm most every one of us probably are familiar with. Maybe some of you have it memorized. It's just six verses, but there's a lot in that psalm that David describes the Lord as his shepherd. And then if you back up to, to, to Psalm 22, and David, as he's penning this psalm, he is a psalm that is quoted and a psalm that we have prophecies concerning the Christ we know as the Lord Jesus and what took place on the cross, we find our Savior. So we find our Savior who is our shepherd, but I think it's also very important for us to understand that he is sovereign. He is the King of glory. He is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords he one day will come and establish his kingdom. He is coming to right the ship. He is coming to fix the wrongs. He is coming to judge the evil and the wicked. He is coming to ultimately do away with Satan for all eternity. He is coming to make this place what he intended it to be from the very beginning where there is no sin, where there is no Satan, where there is no old self where God's glory will shine for all eternity. He is the king, folks. In the midst of him being the king in the here and now, or in the future, he is the king in the here and now. And I think it's important for us to understand that so we can be focused correctly. You know, I, I know what things are like in this whole world. You know, we're just right around the corner, less than a month away, uh, we're, we're going to go to a voting poll. And no matter who you who you think you want to vote for, uh, you already know who I'm going to vote for. It's not going to be a liberal, so whoever you can, it's not going to be some folks it's that, that are standing contrary to, to Christian values, to the Bible, people that are pro-abortion, uh, folks who are pushing the homosexual agenda and the transgender movement. Um, so you already know who I'm going to vote for, right? I don't have to say no names. But, but no matter who wins, because this is, this is the issue that we got going on in our country. This is the issue that we got going on in our communities. You know, I'll tell you what we forget. That's what happens we have, even in our own church, issues we have in our own church. You know what we forget? Jesus is the king of glory, folks. He's seated, he's seated upon the throne. And you know what I understand, too, in the scriptures? He raises up the kings and he brings them down. He's the one that will allow or put in a position of authority as he sees fit, whether it is for our blessing or whether it is for an act of judgment. And either which way, I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. 
And either which way, I'm going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus because I understand that just like he raised up the Assyrians to bring judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel or raised up the Babylonians to bring judgment on the southern kingdom, he also can raise up who he sees fit if it needs to bring judgment on our country as well. Because we live in a place that is godless, a place that seems to went contrary to the foundation or the roots in which we were, we were founded upon. And that is the scriptures. We live in a day and age where the church has went to sleep and she's, she, it's a hard time to wake her up, folks. We're having a hard time waking her up. We live in a time the church remembers not this building, it's the people. And so we have, we have been a people that have went to sleep. We've been a people that have been, that, that have got away from the principles and the ways and the purpose and the mission of the one true and living God. And so with all that being said, we need to get focused upon Jesus as the king. He's our savior. We like to talk about the cross because it's there at the cross where he took my sin. It's there at the cross where he made an open spectacle of Satan himself that through his death and then resurrection, would he overcome sin and the penalty of sin, which is death. And when we trust in Jesus, we're forgiven. We're made clean and righteous and justified. We want to talk about the cross. We want to talk about the love of our Savior. We like to talk about the shepherd who leads us by the still waters and the green pastures. We want to talk about that that good shepherd, that his goodness and mercy pursues us all the days of our life. We love to hear that aspect of our Lord, and that is an awesome aspect. And the thing about God is you don't cut him up. You don't, you don't cut in a, like a pie into pieces and say, I want to talk about his love over here. Guess what? You get him as he is, as a whole. And so you're going to get him as a loving savior. You're going to get him as the compassionate shepherd. But you also got to take him as the sovereign king and Lord. And you know what? Sometimes we just got to get back to that. Sometimes we got to understand who he is. You know? It's, 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 it's the same thing as I was talking yesterday at a little ball field. We're talking with one of the parents of, of one of the other players, and me and him were talking. And, and as we were talking, Aiden was standing there. AJ was, had, had to work yesterday, so he wasn't with us. Annabelle was playing, but Aiden was standing there. I was just talking about being a, a, a parent. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, my kids don't have social media. I said, I got an 18-year-old son. They got social media. They said, he ain't really asked much about it, but he guess what the answer is going to be in my house still? No. He say he's 18 years old. He can do what he wants to. No. He's going to learn. He, he already knows, and he still knows, that his dad is his dad at the house. <laughs> same, thing with, same thing with Aiden. Same thing with Annabelle. And I said, you know what we have to learn sometimes, folks? Let me tell you something. What we need to learn, and we'll get into this passage. Jesus is Lord. Not me and you. you. You know where our rights are? You know where our freedoms are? You know what our privileges are? They're in him. That's where it's at. And so as we're in him, that means that it has to line up with his word, right? It's not, well, we want to do what we want, how we want, but we want the cross, we want his blood. We want his forgiveness. We want his righteousness. But then we want to do and be and whatever it is that we want to be focused on. We want that too. Or we want the shepherd to give us this day our daily bread. Lead us by the green pastures. Lead us by the still waters. Be with us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death with his, with his rod and his staff. Prepare the table for us before our enemies and anoint us with oil and let our cups overflow. We want his hot pursuit of goodness and mercy on our lives. But then we want to choose and do what we want when we want. How we want. Well, folks, guess what? That's not how it works. We got to take him as Lord, too. We got to take him as the King of glory. And as we look into Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord's. Man, we need to highlight that. 
We need to circle it, underline it, put little stars by it, mark your Bible all to pieces right there, and understand this is the Lord's house. Huh? That's why I said, my house, this is my house. This is my house. If you want to live here, you're going to do what you're supposed to do according to my rules. That's why when my family would come home from, uh, come down from Ohio, you know where they didn't want to stay? My house. And why they, especially on Saturdays. Why they didn't want to stay? Because they know we get up going to church. I mean, I've been around folks, church folks, come and say, oh, preacher, sorry, we missed last week. We had unexpected company. I say, you did? Yeah, they come to my house, okay. So, why didn't we have a full pew? Why'd you stay at home and why are they at home? They came to your house. If they came to your house, you, they shouldn't inconvenience you. They should have showed up, huh? But a lot of times that's not what happens, folks. What happens is folks move in, make t- folks come around, they think they're going to run your house. Well, let me tell you something. This is the Lord's house. This is his world. He made all things and everything therein for his good pleasure. He didn't just make it, he sustains it. How many understand this world will continue on as long as he sees fit for it to continue on? It's not about if you and I are using gas, oil, and and coal, or lithium, or electric, or or battery opera vehicles, or you got diesel, or what. It, It don't matter how many smokestacks we got in these factories. It don't matter how many oil rigs have spills out there in the ocean. You know, that's funny to me. They worry about oil spills, but they go out there and dump all our trash out there. Anyway, nothing neither here nor there. But I'm here to tell you that he didn't just make it. He sustains it. This old world is his footstool. He, he, he can't even be contained by this old world. But he owns it. It says the earth is the Lord's. If we're going to get focused on Jesus, we got to see him as who he is, the king of glory, the sovereign one, the maker of the heavens and the earth. The Lord is his. Now look what else it says. And the fullness thereof. Everything in it. Are you in it? You in it. You don't live nowhere else. We've been trying to, ain't we? We're trying to figure out, can we live on Mars? I think some folks showed up from there. Or Jupiter. The old saying was, I don't know if it was the boys that from Mars get more candy bars and the girls are from Jupiter. I guess depending upon who says it. I'll do it the other way. I'll say the girls are from Mars, get more candy bars. The boys from Jupiter, they get more stupider. I don't know where some of these folks are from, but they're here on this earth. And God's the one that made it and everything therein. Amen. He's the one that's in control. He's the one sitting on the throne. Let me tell you something, folks. When life's a ray, when life's a mess, when things are bigger than us, when, when, when all this stuff's happening and we just don't know what to do and the rug's been pulled out from us, underneath us, yeah, you need to stay focused upon the cross. You need to be comforted by the shepherd. But you have to have your foundation sure by the fact that Jesus is sovereign king. He's in control. He's on the throne. He has a purpose and a plan and it's time to see him as such and walk by faith accordingly and not by your sight. I, 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 we, we, we can't worry about everything else. We can't worry about everything else. We need to do what we need to do based on what the scripture as free moral beings We need to pray like Brenda said when we're going through the valley. We need to exercise our freedom and be a light and salt in this old dark world. So when we have our opportunity to go to a vote and poll, we vote according to scripture, not what the media says, not what somebody else trying to manipulate our brains into thinking, but vote according to the scripture. We we need to be a people who's actively involved in what's going on in our communities with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, 
When, when, when things seem like they're going wild, we need to just be focused upon the Lord sitting on the throne. That's what Daniel did. That's what Joseph did. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. You remember when they was told, if you don't bow down, you're going to be cast into the fiery furnace. And those three Hebrew boys said, you know what? <laughs> Whether he delivers us or not, we're not bowing down. It's an old statue that you made. And they stoked up that old furnace so hot and some of them that got close died from the heat. But when they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there, and they, they, they somehow got close enough to look and see if they had been, you know, just, just burn up. They said, hold on, how many did we throw in there? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and who else? And they said, hold on, that looked like somebody like the, the son of God in there. There was a fourth man in the fire. I believe it was a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord Jesus. That when, when the fire got hot, Jesus come on in there with them. You know why? Because they didn't look at their circumstance. They looked at the one sitting on the throne. And they said if he purposes himself to protect us in the fire, so be it. And if not, so be it. But we're not going to bow down to some idol, some false god, or some human down here. We're going to follow after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is our God. We're going to follow him, the one sitting on the throne. Folks, that's where we've got to be. Why? Because he is the one who's in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. You hear these celebrities get all tore up about whoever's going to be the next president. Well, if so-and-so's elected, I'm moving on. I'm going to this country and living this country. I mean, pack them and send them. But let me tell you something. At the same time as that, let me tell you this. There ain't nowhere else to go. I don't care what kind of technology Elon Musk comes up with. There ain't nowhere else to go, folks. You get on a little rocket, you'll be like some of those folks that, that went up there right now, them astronauts. They went up there for two or three days. They ain't coming back for months. And guess what they're still doing? Trying to come back. There ain't no packing up and leaving. Jesus is the Lord, folks. Recognize that. Focus on that now. This is his world and everything in it and everyone that dwells in it. It is his. He's on the throne and it's time for us to get focused on him. That's what we've got to do. Goes on to say, for he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And you go back to the very beginning of creation. It says he created the heavens and the earth and then talks about the waters above all over the face of the deep. He established it. He created, made it out of nothing. Ex nihilio, as they say in some theological realms. Out of nothing did he create everything. He established it. He's the one on the throne. He's on the throne. We got to look upon him. Not only do you need to look upon the one who created everything, but you got to look upon the one who is holy. Look what it goes on to say. It says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from God, the God of his salvation. You know what we got to do today, folks? We need to look upon the sovereign king who is the creator. We need to look upon the sovereign God who is holy and righteous. I mean, think about the world in which we live in. It's a mess, isn't it? You know why it's a mess? Because this is, this is the culture we live in. We live in such a mess of a culture because we have pushed this idea of relative truth so much. Now, I mean, this has happened years and years and years ago. I graduated in 2004 at Clear Creek, from Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And, and there was a big push about the postmodern movement. And we were learning about this in Bible, in Bible college, in the worldviews and understanding how to, to, to deal with the culture we live in. But we've been pushing 
relative truth. I mean, what's true for you is true for you. And what's true for me is true for me, even if they contradict itself. That, that's the world we live in. They say, well, this is my truth. Have you heard people say that? Well, this is my truth. What? Your truth. That ain't your truth. Truth is truth. You don't line up with it or not, but it's not your truth. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is the truth. So all truth comes from him. But neither, neither here nor there, we live in a day and age right now that we don't know what to do and, and we got so much mixed up stuff going on in the world and we don't know how to wade through it. You know why? Because we've been trying to teach that. It's just whatever's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. That's why I get so, so it's almost, almost like not, not frustrated. I don't know. It's not funny because it's not funny situations. But I watch all this garbage going on. They're exposing these people and that person and this person, what they did this and they do that. And they've had these parties and they've done all this and all that. And now all of a sudden we're some moral country. All of a sudden we're some moral country. Can you believe what this person did or that person did or these folks did? Well, what's the problem here? If this country's done away with this book as the standard, you tell me why anything matters. You tell me why anything matters. What standard are we going by? What's the problem with what some of these celebrities do? By what standard are they judged and held accountable to? Huh? It can't be your standard and my standard because that's going to change with the wind. That's like these old liberals that we got going on and, and want to run the country. Oh, it's, it's like we're accepting, tolerant of everything except for those who hold to the scripture. Culture where we have muddied the water and we've muddied our vision because, because we have tried to, to manipulate what truth is. But this is the facts, folks. Jesus, who is the truth, is not only sitting on the throne as the sovereign king because he's the creator. He's on the throne as the holy one and whom everybody is measured up to. That's why they don't want to have that name spoke. That's why they don't want the word proclaimed. Because when you hold up the Holy One, when you lift up the Word of God, every response has to be like Isaiah. Woe is me, a man of unclean lips, in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You know what we've got to get back to, folks? Focused upon Jesus as the Holy One so you and I could be humbled and brought before His throne. Guess why? Because when you and I will humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, guess what He does? He forgives, He cleanses, and He lifts us up. That's what He does. He takes filthy, rotten sinners who come by the way of the cross because He's a compassionate shepherd who died for the sheep. The sovereign one who's holy, guess what He does? He makes us holy. But we've got to see him as who he is. And we've got to get back to not only seeing him as that, but Peter tells us to be holy as he is holy. So we must strive to live with the help of the Spirit of God and of course to the Word of God to be holy as he's holy. Now this is the neat thing about when you get saved. You are sanctified immediately. Your position is you're set apart. And you start through a process where he is making you more like himself from the inside out of sanctification. So positionally, you're set apart. And then he starts working on you to bring that title to fruition in your life. But that only happens when you and I are focused upon him and we walk with him as we're supposed to. Who's a, who, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who's going to stand in his holy place? Not everybody. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul in vanity or sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Meaning that you got, if you're gonna, you're gonna stand before the Lord, you gotta be saved. But we've got to see him as the holy one. He goes on to say, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. Oh, it says, oh, Jacob, it's a better understanding is, oh, God, oh, 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 the God of Jacob. And it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall 
come in. We don't just need to see him as the sovereign one sitting on the throne because he's the creator and the holy one. But look, he's the returning one. What it says, lift up your heads, all ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord God Almighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Some of y'all that are here on Wednesday nights, y'all got to help me re be reminded and remember that Psalm 24, 8, Psalm 24, 10, we need to learn them for these kids to remember and adults too. As we memorize some verses, we quote several verses on Wednesday nights. We go over a lot of times the same ones, repetition, so they can do it from their heart and their mind instead of just looking at something on the screen. But this is, this is something that they need to learn. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Let me tell you something. Jesus is coming again. And when Jesus comes again, he's coming to rapture his church, to resurrect the church, eight saints. I think that's the next event on God's prophetic calendar. Contrary to what some folks out there trying to teach right now, it's becoming prevalent. It's, it's funny to me because I, th I think, I think Satan is, is a mastermind, folks. He wants to get us off track. Let me tell you what I'm, I'm not fearing. I'm not fearing all the mess of this world. And even if I was dead wrong and, 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 and I had to start through the tribulation period, which I don't think that we're going to be going through. But even if, even if that was the case, let whatever may come, I got my eyes focused on Jesus. I'm sweating that small stuff. You say, that's the worst time in human history. That's what Jesus himself said. But in comparison to Jesus, it's the small stuff. I'm not going to sweat the small stuff. But I'm not looking, I'm looking for and listening for the, the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel, Jesus stepping on the clouds of glory. I'm anticipating those, those, those graves to come up first if I'm still lying during that time. And I'm going to be like, where are you going? And I'll be right after them. And I'm ready to meet Jesus in the air and this old glorified body to stand before me in the judgment seat of Christ to have my works tried as of by fire, to be overly to receive some rewards, to be able to cast them back at his feet as an offering unto him because I was saved by grace, kept by grace, got to serve him by his grace and I'm going to give it back to him as thanksgiving. I'm anticipating his return. I'm also understanding, folks, that who is the king of glory? He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the Lord of the battle. When he comes, folks, everybody's going to come against him under the leadership of Satan, but they're going to fall to the king of glory. Amen. Don't be sweating the small stuff out here. Get your eyes focused on Jesus, the sovereign one who's coming again. When he comes again, folks, every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess to the glory of the Father. When all the kings of the world gather, you go read the book of Revelation, it talks about, talks about Satan, the old dragon. It talks about O Antichrist, the first beast coming up out of sea. It talks about those second beasts, old false prophet coming up out the earth. It talks about this unholy trinity and out from them does these Frogs, demons, describe them as frogs that are going about and, and are going to persuade all of the kingdoms of this old world to try to gather together in the Valley of Megiddo to come against the Lord Jesus. But when he shows up with his church split in the eastern sky, stepping upon the Mount of Olives from the sword from his mouth, from his spoken word, are all of the kings and the king of this world going to be put to death, folks, where the blood will come up to the bridle of a horse's mouth. Ain't nobody going to survive coming against the Lord of the battle. So I don't worry about all what's going on out here. Let him fight his fight. You know, we've all been through things. We've all go through things that just, 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 just hurt us, that, that cause all these different emotions. Guess what? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So it says in the book of Romans and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, guess what it talks about? 
the vengeance of the Lord upon those who come against his people. Go read that chapter. Oh, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with the bride. Huh? You don't want to mess with the bride. Try to stamp out the church. No problem. The bridegroom's coming. Huh? The bridegroom's coming. Oh, when Jesus comes, folks, ain't nobody wanting to mess with that. Oh, don't be deceived. Don't be mistaken. Don't get caught up in the baby that's goo goo gagging, wrapped up in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. They have no place in the end, so they put him out there amongst the animals. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived about the one who was led as a lamb who did not speak and they nailed him to an old rugged cross. Don't be deceived by thinking of the one who was mocked and ridiculed and beaten to a bloody pulp and spit upon and, and all that took place. Don't be deceived and think or mistake him as one who is weak. Just remember that the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world is coming back as a line of the tribe of Judah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, folks. And everybody is going to know who he is. Let's not be mistaken. And, and as we get refocused, we got to see him as such. Is the Lord strong and mighty? The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, all your gates. Even lift them up, all ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Oh, we've been studying the book of Revelation with our young people on Wednesday nights. We just finish up to chapter 21 and, and we seen a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and start describing the new Jerusalem. 12, founda 12 foundations of variety of precious stones with the names of the apostles. 12 gates made each one by one giant pearl with the name of the 12 tribes of Israel on them. Three on each sign four sides of that city. It says that the gates, they're not ever shut. And there's no need for the S-U-N and no need for the moon to shine its light because the light of the S-O-N is going to shine for all eternity. And as the gates are open, guess what? He's going to be there and there's no, no need for a temple. Why? Because he is the temple. And his people will come in and out. Remember what he said in, in, in John chapter 10? That, that I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. My sheep, they hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. They come in and out and find pasture. Huh. Lift up those doors. Lift up those or open up those gates. For the Lord himself will enter in. Who is this king of glory? the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. It's time for us to see him as the king. Let me tell you why we struggle. As people who, who say they're saved, why we struggle? We want to see the Savior on the cross. And that's where you got to start. Until you come to the cross, you have no relationship with Jesus. But as you go from the cross and see him as your savior and grow and understand him as your shepherd, th those are great. But you got to see him as the sovereign king, the Lord God Almighty, the king of glory. That means the king of your life. And, and, and let me tell you something. That's why when all of a sudden things were rocked, we're like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Not that if your eyes are focused on them, those things wouldn't come. Those things happen anyway. The apostle Paul, oh, he had all kinds of difficulties. But he was walking with the Lord like he needed to. 
He didn't just experience him as a savior on the, on the road to Damascus. He just experiment, experienced him as the shepherd. Say he was a couple years off in Arabia, learning of the Lord and growing in that way. But he lived for him as his sovereign king. And so if the Lord led him in prison, he was in prison. If the Lord had him shipwrecked, he was shipwrecked. If the Lord had him in some city in which folks rose up and stoned him to kill him and drug him outside the, the city, then that, then that so be it. If he was free, then he was free. If he was hungry, he was hungry. If he was clothed, he was clothed. If he was naked, he was naked. If he's warm, he's warmer. If he's cold, he's cold. It didn't matter to him. Why? Because he understood I'm following the plan of the sovereign king. So whatever he wants and wherever he leads, that's what I'm going to do and that's where I'm going to go. So he faced it. So when it came time to die and that guy that had the axe or guillotine or whatever it was in which they took the head off of Paul when he got done sharpening that blade up They said, Paul, he started doing this right here. They thought he's fighting. He said, I ain't fighting. I'm trying to get loose to go to the chopping block. You ain't got to drag me there. I'm going to beat you in a foot race. Huh? Why? Because he knew. Oh, he knew who the king of glory was. He knew that when his head was to leave his body, he freaking opened his eyes in the presence of Jesus. What about you today? Who are you focused on today? You focused on all your troubles and trials, maybe your own little world or the things going on in this world? I can become overwhelming if that's what you're looking at. But if your eyes seen the Savior, John chapter 3, says that Jesus had to be lifted up, just like the serpent in the wilderness in Moses' day. And you remember, and those folks in the wilderness were being bit by the snakes. In order for them to be safe from that, they had to look to the bronze serpent lifted up. Guess what? You and I are affected by sin. The only way to be delivered from that is to look to the Savior who is lifted up. Have you focused on him as your Savior? If not, that's where we need to start today. Look to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Turn from your sin, call out to him, and let him come into your life and save you today. Are you growing if you're saved? Him as a shepherd? Looking to him as the shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Are you worried about what's going to be like? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Is he your sovereign King, is it yes, Lord? Because remember, folks, you can't say no, Lord. That's a contradiction. If he's the Lord, that means he's the boss. That means he's the one with the final say. It's not no, it's yes, sir. It's amen, it's hallelujah, it's I'm following you. Whatever may come, even so, Lord Jesus. If not, if he's not your, if you're not surrendered to him as Lord, you should come today and say, here am I. If you know you're saved, why don't you come and say, Lord, here am I. I won't be your servant. I'm not being as I need to be. Here am I. Stephanie, coming. You come to lead us in time of invitation. Let's pray together. And this altar will be open for you. For to come, do business with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you right now in the name of Jesus, thanking you for this day. And Lord, as we try to get refocused upon you, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would uh, just go back to the cross. If we've been there before, we know that we've been saved. I pray that even right now, we would reflect upon the time we got saved. And Lord, as we're trying to go back to that place, if we cannot go back there because we've really never been there, I pray that right now, those that are lost and need to be saved would ask you 
to forgive them of their sin. Believing that you are God who became a man for them, died on the cross for them, rose again from the dead, overcoming their sin, that they would ask you not only to forgive you, forgive them of their sin, but ask you to come into their lives and save them as they surrender their self to you. Pray if someone is asking you into their life in a moment, they would come and say, you know what? I need to be saved. I wanted to be saved. And I gave my life to Jesus today and make that public. Lord, for us who are saved, I pray, Lord, as we, we think about that time that we got saved, I pray that we'll reflect upon our walk with you as our shepherd and also examine our lives if we've been surrendered to you as our sovereign king. And I pray we respond to you accordingly, do business with you today as you give us this awesome opportunity to do business with you. We give you the honor and glory and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>